Um, thank you so much for coming. I have to say I was kind of keeping my expectations low for turnout. You know, the sun's out, sort of exam period, everyone's marking. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Really happy always to be in the Grantham Institute and see sort of old people that I know and you as well. Um, I am going to give a talk that's sort of partly about my research and partly about uh, the bigger picture that I've been kind of getting interested in. So the the idea of this is the first sort of half of the talk or so. Is there a clock in here? Yeah. Um, that, that doesn't work. Yes, it does. Um, it is going to be on um, extreme sea level rise, almost like a mini history of how we... Uh, just touching on a few interesting points of how we've tried to think about extreme sea level rise, rapid sea level rise, over the time scale of about a century. Um, and then move on to some of my work in trying to predict that for Antarctica, so the contribution from Antarctica. Um. Oh, no. <laughs> We've had some AV trouble. And I literally just pressed the button and it went... Okay, wait, let's try again. Wait, pause. Maybe it's the clicker... I do it on there. It is not doing anything. There's Keynote. That works. That works. Okay. Yes. Okay. Keep your fingers crossed for me. Um, so this idea of ice apocalypse that I put in the title comes from... Um, I'm going to sort of start from now and then kind of go back uh, further into the past afterwards comes from um, a paper that came out in 2016 about Antarctica. And it was reported in this way, Scientific American, Antarctic uh, meltdown could double sea level rise. It was the biggest climate science paper that year in terms of altmetrics and media attention. And kind of much later, actually, sort of a year and a half after it was even published, uh, it got talked about as the main driver for this article in Grist, um, headlined ice apocalypse. Rapid collapse of Antarctic glaciers could flood coastal cities by the end of the century. And there was this sort of phrase in here, all this could play out in a mere 20 to 50 years, much too quickly for humanity to adapt. Um, so I want to kind of examine this, but in the context of general sea level rise and how we come up with these numbers. Um, and I wrote a response to this Grist article, actually, in The Guardian, how soon will the ice apocalypse come? Uh, saying that I thought that this article by Eric Holthouse was uh, too pessimistic, um, that it overstates the possibility of disaster, too soon, too certain. And this is uh, a version of a talk that I first gave um, about a year ago at a Cambridge meeting on, um, I forgot the exact title, but catastrophic risk, sort of ex existential threats to humanity, which is really interesting. And I've been thinking about kind of how we construct knowledge about sea level rise. And why, so for me, I started off in um, uh, global climate modelling with HADCM3 um, originally, uh, paleoclimate modelling of the glass glacial maximum and the mid Holocene. And then I moved into the ice sheet contribution to sea level rise. And it's felt a little different to me, the community and the way that the knowledge is built up. So I'm, I'm sort of, I've become a bit interested in that and why it feels a bit different from global climate. Well, one thing we really noticed in big projects like an EU project that I was involved with called Ice to Sea is that there's this massive causal chain of processes. You know, within this EU project, we had um, global climate models obviously run by, um, forced by greenhouse gas um, scenarios uh, going through to, uh, so the global climate models would then force regional climate models over, green, over the, the two poles, basically, over Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, those would then have to force the ice sheet models, and then the fresh water from the ice sheet models would go back into global climate models to see how it would affect um, ocean circulation. So this kind of incredible complexity, particularly when you try and also put in the thermal expansion uh, from global climate models, when you, when you put in glacier contributions, um, and, and all the feedbacks, you know, you have to think about the atmospheric feedbacks and the ocean feedbacks with, with the ice sheet and everything's at the boundaries of the ice in that sense. And ice sheets depend on, annoyingly, um, small spatial scales, which is, you know, true of global climate in lots of ways, like clouds, but also very long time scales. So they have, I guess, both short and very long time scale responses. If you think about uh, res responding to ice age cycle time scales, tens of thousands of years for... Um, 
for the ice temperature to adjust to the climate. Um, and the small spatial scale stuff, it's, you know, how does, uh, you know, the formation of kind of snow from moisture in the atmosphere, how that um, falls onto the surface of the ice sheet and compacts into fern and then eventually ice. Um, you, channels that form in the ice that may take away meltwater, that's uh, quite common in Greenland particularly, or on ice shelves. Crevasses that can happen and, and cause ice shelves to break up. Little bumps in the bedrock that can prevent and slow down ice um, streams from flowing. Um, so, you know, I'm not trying to kind of give a, an entire history of all ice sheet um, uh, and sea level science here, but you get the gist that it's, it's, there's quite a lot of things going on um, at different scales. And, and of course, they're remote and dangerous, both um, the ice sheets and glaciers, mountain glaciers, and the oceans in general, if you're, if you're considering all components of sea level rise. Um, you know, really, we only started to get a, a true understanding of the vulnerability of the ice sheets in the satellite era, so very recent, especially when you consider that those long time scales are so important. Um, the bedrock, for example, under Antarctica is not um, fully known, uh, even though I said it was important. Um, you know, they're d inaccessible places, you know, the middle of ice sheets and glaciers and, and the middle of the oceans. There's this quote, it has long been said, this was in 98, um, that the ice sheets are less well mapped than the dark side of the moon, which I think is rather nice. And so kind of as a function of all this, I think, um, ice sheet modelling is, is a kind of a newer science, really, than global climate modeling, modeling that had that basis in weather modelling from the 60s. Um, you know, really kind of it probably started 30 years later, sort of in earnest, um, given all, the, all of these things. So how do we try and understand about sea level rise? I'm focusing on the ice sheets, but sort of broadly. Um, how do we construct knowledge, for example, about what's the maximum sea level rise we might face this century? And that's effectively the main scientific question that I'm interested in. And I'm going to talk about three ways in which we try and figure this problem out. The past, so using analogues from the distant past, from paleoclimate eras, and the recent past. Using the imagination, basically what could happen, what might happen, what's possible. Asking experts, and then physics, so really coming back to what we are more used to, uh, perhaps as physical climate scientists, is the observations and the physical model simulations. But all of this leads to a sort of a parallel interest of mine, which is the narratives that we construct around that knowledge. And because there's, because there's limited knowledge in these areas, there's more space for the creation of storyline and narrative and people perhaps creating narrative around, around different lines of evidence about how compelling they are and how concerning they are in terms of future sea level rise, which I'm really interested in. So starting with the past, could the future be like the distant past or the recent past when it comes to sea level rise. And this is from the IPCC um, uh, AR5 2013 Fifth Assessment Report. And it basically shows rate of sea level change at different periods in the past. And broadly speaking, this is sort of today, we're down at sort of three millimeters per year uh, or so in the 20th century, a little bit more recently. Um, and these massive blue bars are much, much faster sea level rise happening in the past. And I'll talk about these eras, but this, this here is the um, 22,000 to 7,000 years ago. So this is since the last ice age, uh, since the last glacial maximum. And then this period here of about 15,000 years ago, I'm going to talk about meltwater pulse 1A briefly. So this is, you know, worrying. You know, sea level rise has been really, really massive in the past. And so meltwater pulse 1A, starting with the biggest bar. And this was something that... Um, really worried a lot of people, I think, uh, certainly 10 or 15 years ago. So, as I say, about 14, 15,000 years ago, uh, this is um, uh, just from, um, you can find it on Wikipedia, actually, the uh, sea level rise from 24,000 years ago that I was just mentioning, the last height of the last ice age around about here, sea level rising to the present day. And this kind of blip here of rapid sea level rise is this meltwater pulse 1A where the sort of rough estimates are kind of these four or five uh, metres per century, if you convert the previous bar. Um, so imagining four or five metres happening this century. Uh, so this, so this uh, paper, this op-ed actually by James Hansen, I think it was a, an op-ed in 2005, 
really drew attention to this as a concern, calling it explosively rapid. So all my little kind of narrative and, and description quotes are in boxes like this. Explosively rapid. And of course, you know, so this is five meters um, change in land elevation, so it's a very rough ballpark of what that would look like in terms of sea level. It's a bit more complicated than that, but as a rough idea, you know, this is clearly um, difficult to adapt to in 100 years. And so, understandably, this paper in 2005 caused a lot of concern. Moving, I'm just going to come back to the, the plausibility of that in a second, but moving on to the other bar, considering the last deglaciation I mentioned from 22,000 to 7,000 years ago, the estimate of that is more like sort of one to one and a half meters per century, so much lower. This is just a little excerpt from a graph I'm going to show on the next slide, showing relative sea level um, from the present day, here naught back in time in thousands of years. And so this last deglaciation is, um, uh, so the, the last glacial maximum is here. So you've got the sea level rise from then. And then we can also look at the last interglacial around 100 and, uh, sort of 10 to 130,000 years ago here. Um, you know, the, the kind of rise, um, the, ra the, the maximum rates here, uh, or the, the rates in that period, about one and a half plus or minus one meter per century was a sort of a, quite an influential estimate um, by Ilko, Rowling and others in 2008. Um, a bit more recently, uh, Bob Kopp and others came up with a perhaps a slightly lower estimate of 95% uh, probability of less than about a meter per century. And, and you'll find in this talk that this kind of one to one and a half meters comes up a lot per century. So remember that. Um, and this was kind of relevant because this particular paper informed the UK climate projections 2009. So the big Met Office uh, based project that informed UK government adaptation plans. And effectively, the, the upper end of the, the H++ scenario, they called it, was two and a half meters uh, by 2100. So that's roughly you know, the mean plus one um, standard deviation here. And that's still used today. This is um, the UK climate change risk assessment uh, from a couple of years ago or so. Um, and the extreme, uh, so, so this is actually, um, uh, don't, don't, I'm not asking you to read the numbers, it's just there if you want to look at the, the report later. I wrote a report around the same time, um, an evidence review for Foresight, the Government Office for Science, on flooding and or sea level rise and flooding in the UK basically drawing out some of the numbers from this on coastal flooding and this extreme scenario of two and a half meters was still being used. So this table of numbers shows kind of things like how many properties are affected now versus under two and a half meters. So very much used as a worst case scenario in the UK since that time of 2009 or so. But you know, what's wrong with using the past? Well, the past isn't like today and it isn't like the future. This is um, a paper by uh, Lauren Gregoire in Leeds, a collaborator of mine, um, looking at this meltwater pulse 1A. And of course, one way that you can get very rapid rates of sea level rise uh, from ice sheets is to have very, very big ice sheets. And that was the case, of course, we had this big Laurentide ice sheet, this is North America. At that time, so this, this picture is sort of from just before meltwater pulse 1A, where the red is the uh, reconstructed extent of the ice sheet from data, and then the blue is the simulated uh, sort of best estimate of the ice sheet shape. And you can get a lot of extra and rapid sea level rise when you have a lot more ice on the planet. Um, looking, so looking back um, at the sort of uh, interglacial, well, glacial interglacial cycles, expanding that graph out to five, cycles, so 500,000 years here, we've got the relative sea level going up and down and up and down between the glacial cycles, and this is the rate um, of change, basically kind of changing and then spiking and so forth from this paper in 2014. And what they drew from that, when they looked at the different rates of sea level rise um, over the, that 500,000 years, this is the maximum sea level rate rise rate against the, the ice volume um, the ratio of the ice volume to today. And so what that's showing is this blue box here where when the, whenever the ice was sort of one to one and a half times the amount that we've got today, then the rate of sea level rise was sort of up to about one to one and a half meters per century. So that's really saying that to get those much bigger numbers, you have to have much bigger ice sheets. And so 
in 2013, um, actually before that paper, uh, but sort of generally, the IPCC basically made an assessment of the, the use of these paleo periods to think about ice sheet change in the past and sea level change in the past, saying it's primarily from much larger ice sheets that no longer exist, particularly in this case for Meltwater Pulse 1A. And even when the ice sheets are closer to the present day, the forcings are different. So in the last interglacial, you know, it's really dominated by um, things like Milankovitch cycles, the, the, the forcings from um, uh, insulation rather than, um, you know, the forcings that we've got today of greenhouse gas emissions um, or concentrations. So really saying, you know, this is useful sort of scoping out an understanding of the Earth system, but we shouldn't maybe use it to estimate the rates directly that could happen now. So that's the distant past, touching on it. Um, what about the recent past? So this is idea called semi-empirical modeling, uh, SEM, which basically means extrapolation from the recent past, say the last 100, 150 years. And this was started by Stefan Ramstorff in 2007, who here is just literally showing the rate of sea level change in the past, in millimeters per year, against the warming. So it's relating the sea level rise to the warming in the recent past, using that relationship to project into the future. And these numbers, and so this is a, this um, graph here is from, again, from AR5, showing a, a few different studies, later studies, sort of 2010 to 2013, showing that these, these methods of this extrapolation from the recent past, effectively, uh, are again coming up with that kind of magic one to one and a half meters per century as the upper end. And these were, coming back to the language, these semi-empirical methods were uh, created in response to the idea that models were inadequate. Process-based physical models were inadequate. While process-based physical models of sea level rise are not yet mature. This was the 2007 paper, and it was well known that we didn't really, we knew that ice sheet models were not complete enough to include all of the important processes. But in 2013, in AR5, um, these semi-empirical methods were not incorporated in the main assessment for future sea level rise for this century or beyond. Uh, and there was this rather, in my view, sort of damning sentence saying there was no consensus in the scientific community about their reliability. Now, it's not to say the maths is wrong or anything like that, but of course the assumptions. If you think about it, the contributions to sea level rise in the 20th century are different, actually, from what we expect in the 21st century and beyond. So thermal expansion and mountain glaciers are particularly important um, over the last 100 years. Uh, but going into the future, eventually, effectively, the glaciers will run out. The mountain glaciers will not, no longer contribute. Um, Greenland has been increasing as a, as a contribution, and we are seeing Antarctica increase as a contribution. So the physical assumptions about the relationship between temperature and sea level rise break down, we think. You know, it's not a linear uh, relationship. Does that make sense? Okay. So, the, so, so again, kind of in response to this idea that we just didn't know how to predict sea level rise, if you like, there's this idea of sort of what I've termed the imagination. So what, by that, I mean expert elicitation and effectively the IPCC assessment process itself. And I'm super aware of that at the moment because as a new um, lead author on IPCC, I'm, I'm really aware of the difference between a literature review, you describe you know, what these different papers say and put them together and try and make it clear, versus an assessment. And an assessment is really what is plausible, credible, robust, what has a lot of lines of evidence to support the same thing? What is just one paper that's an outlier? What are the different techniques? Do we have multiple independent lines of evidence? That assessment process is so, so important. And I think we don't always realize when we read IPCC reports how much goes into that process as authors and, ha and how that adds to the value, hopefully, of the reports themselves. Okay. So the first expert elicitation uh, in 20, was in 2013. So this is an, a, a technique that's been used in other areas like uh, trying to predict the unpredictable, basically, like earthquakes and volcanoes. Uh, this guy, Willie Aspinall in Bristol, is an expert in this area. 
And effectively, you take um, a bunch of experts and you ask them what they think is going to happen. And you can do a certain amount of calibration of those experts, like asking them about questions that you do know the answer to and seeing if they're not only are they uh, close to that answer, but are they overconfident or underconfident when they put error bars on things? And don't worry about the details, but broadly speaking, they, they sort of did this idea of you know, how quickly could sea level rise from um, East Antarctica, this is Greenland, and West Antarctica. And West Antarctica is the key one because it goes from not very much, not very rapid sea level contribution through to a lot. Um, so this would be uh, one meter per century I think, uh, alone from that uh, West Antarctic um, ice sheet. And so this was, again, kind of coming up to sort of, well, perhaps up to about two metres per century at the time that we reached the end of the century, but just from the ice sheets alone. So the idea of this, this expert elicitation was they were trying to think beyond the bounds of what the models can do. What are the, what are the models missing and what could that mean? How much higher could that sea level be? And again, the AR5 basically assessed that there was a lack of consensus here. You know, this is a long tail. This is a lot of different possibilities in the future. A lack of consensus on the prob probability, particularly for Antarctic collapse, which I'm going to focus on more. So the sort of headline of sea level rise in AR5 was this figure. So as I say, it was what, you know, even just in 2013, it was really thought, well, not only do we know that most physical models are pretty incomplete or have some you know, limitations that we know are important, but also no uncertainty estimates. So typically, ice sheet models will run once into the future, maybe once for each scenario, maybe once for quite an abstract scenario. And there wasn't really any ensemble studies, no uncertainty assessment of trying out different versions of the model and different possibilities. And the kind of classic thing that IPCC does in assessments that sort of sticking as a bit of a method is to take, if you do have multiple models, so results from different institutions, you take the range of, effectively the range of that, of the predictions of those models, and then you say, well, we know that this isn't every possible prediction that we could do. We know there's things we haven't thought of. So let's say the actual uncertainty range is this big. So you go from the model range and you say, well, there's, a, there's about a two in three chance that sea level rise is actually in the model range, but there's about a one in three chance it's outside that, above or below. So that's this part here. And what this graph shows is, is what that two in three chance uh, range looks like. So from 2000 to 2100, going through to projections now, the red is RCP 8.5, so your worst case emissions scenario uh, sea level rise, the scale here going up to one meter, the sort of two and, three prob two and three or greater probability range goes up to about a meter. So again, kind of coming back to this, is sea level rise going to be more than a meter this century? Um, and so, so the model range uh, was converted to this. And then there was this idea, which I'm going to explain in a minute, about the possibility of Antar the Antarctic ice sheet collapsing, which I've hinted at already. And this wasn't really even begun to be included in the models as a possibility. And so, so there was no way they could put a number on what contribution that would be, or even on the probability that it would occur, even vaguely. So they made this kind of semi-quantitative statement, this sort of slightly hedgy statement about Antarctica, which was, there was medium confidence that if a collapse were initiated in Antarctica, it would not exceed several tenths of a meter during the 21st century, leaving that open to interpretation what several means. I mean, I think technically it's three or more, but you know, so 30 centimeters or more, but deliberately vague. And that was the way that they felt that they could uh, describe the knowledge that they had. After AR5 came out, there was another fight for the narrative, right? So you've got, if you think about it, you've got the sort of, a pa I mean, this overlaps. I'm not trying to say this is a big fight, but you've got the sort of the paleo data people. You've got the semi-empirical modelers. You've got the process-based ice sheet modelers. And, and, the, and, and the, 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 all of these are sort of slightly trying to compete. If you think about it, it's a weird science, right, prediction. You know, we're all basically having a big debate about whose model or whose hypothesis or whose method is more reliable than anyone else's. And we won't know if we're right till the end of our careers or never. 
So that's quite a weird position to be in and quite a weird part of science. And so, so this idea of narrative, I think, is really important in understanding and contextualizing that and being aware of that process going on and acknowledging that process and the, and the, and the debates and subjectivity around that. And this is a nice example of that because after AR5 came out, there was another expert elicitation. Now, you may remember the other one was ice sheet experts, so effectively ice sheet modelers and glaciologists. This was sea level experts, so this is broadened out to effectively those paleoclimate sea level people, semi empirical modelers, who tended to be coming up with the higher numbers. And so they came up with, okay, so, you know, not super higher here, 95% probability less than 1.5 meters per century, but if you remember the AR5 only really went up to a meter, um, and, and it was reported as experts say the IPCC underestimated future sea level rise. Now, I thought the IPCC was supposed to be made up of experts. So this idea of fighting what's the true expert, what's the complete set of experts, what's the representative set of experts, I think is really interesting. And in that article, um, uh, John, John Abraham wrote, what they found isn't pretty, you know, as in having thought about it more deeply, they thought sea level rise could be more rapid and serious than the AR5 authors had concluded. So that's, the, that's basically the sort of first half focusing on the big sea level picture. But you'll, you'll notice, obviously, that Antarctica is a focus. And that's not just because it's my research area, uh, although mostly it is, but also because it's the most uncertain part of future sea level rise, certainly this century. Um, and it's, it's, it's a key to understanding this long tail in the distribution of sea level rise. So the statement, if a collapse were initiated. So I want to bring in this idea of marine ice sheet instability, for those of you who don't, uh, aren't familiar with it. Here's Antarctica, and I, I just love this image. Uh, and I just want to kind of slightly orientate, orientate, orient you if, orientate you if you're not familiar with it too much. So here's the peninsula. Um, this section here is a big focus. This is the Amundsen Sea embayment. Uh, there's a couple of big glaciers here I'm going to be talking about called Pine Island and Thwaites. These flattish bits here are massive ice shelves, so underneath there is ocean, whereas most of the rest of it's uh, on rock or sediment. Um, there's a kind of a continental shelf of, of rock that goes around here, so that it's almost like the whole of Antarctica is sat on a little stand. In, the, in terms of the, the rock at the bottom of the ocean. And all of this part is East Antarctica, so there's a, an unequal division. So roughly speaking, if you follow these transantarctic mountains up and up sort of here, broadly speaking, everything to the left of that line is West Antarctica, so all of this bit and the peninsula, and then the, all of the massive rest of it is East Antarctica. And it's West Antarctica that we're most concerned about and the Amundsen Sea embayment in particular. And the reason for that is this. This is the bedrock on which the ice sheet is sitting. Uh, this is bed map two. So here's the peninsula. You can see the mountains under the peninsula. That's the Transantarctic mountain range that I mentioned before. Here's all sort of East Antarctica. And what you can notice about West Antarctica is that it's mostly blue colored. And that means that the bedrock is below sea level. And particularly getting darker and darker blue as you go in. So there are some bits of East Antarctica that look similar, but sort of systematically, there's a big kind of trough going into West Antarctica. It's a marine ice sheet. Now, this marine ice sheet instability is interesting. This is our Higgs boson, right? So this is 40, uh, yeah, 30, no, 50 years ago. Sorry, 50 years ago was the Higgs boson that was 40. Um, 50 years ago, um, Mercer had this idea of how this West Antarctic ice sheet could collapse based on paleo evidence, actually. So an idea of a positive feedback of ice loss. So by collapse, I mean, you know, effectively something that gets triggered and then just keeps on going. It's unstable. It's, um, you know, once you push the ball rolling down the hill, it keeps going. And the motivation for that theory uh, or that hypothesis was the fact that they knew that there'd been these past interglacials, past deglaciations, um, and, uh, and higher sea levels as a result. Um, and some idea about kind of warmer summer temperatures over Antarctica, perhaps, as well. And so this is this rather nice um, diagram from that paper showing uh, the grounded ice you see and the ice shelves, all of this West Antarctic ice sheet collapsing in exactly those regions that I mentioned that were 
below sea level. Um, so this was uh, the idea of the last Sid's Glacial, but the idea was, um, in that paper he said, it, if this happened in the future, it would be ra rapid, perhaps even catastrophic. Um, and then 10 years later wrote another paper about it, calling it a threat of disaster. So this was very much um, a concern. And the reason I say it's a Higgs boson is, you know, we think um, this may be happening now. But I'll come on to that in a minute. It predicted a much long, much, many decades before we had the first observational suggestions of it happening. And this is a really beautiful picture of um, the velocity of the ice, just showing effectively that it's an incredibly complex but very important and dynamic um, uh, set of catchments and glacier flows. So it really looks like you know river catchment map. Um, so you have all these glaciers flowing to the sea. You know, it's not this big sort of static ice block. Here's that Pine Island Glacier that I mentioned and the Thwaites Glacier. Uh, the very bluey pink bits, the very rapid bits are the ice shelves. Um, and you can see these kind of static ridges in the middle when not much is flowing. Um, but, you know, these things are kind of draining all the time. And so, you know, the ice sheet is this slow but dynamic place of flow. And that's key to understanding it. Of course, what's, what matters is if that flow speeds up, because that contributes more to sea level, uh, more ice into the ocean, or if the edge of this ice sheet retreats, which is another way that that's giving a net contribution to sea level. And this um, picture showing sort of Pine Island glacier side on shows the idea behind this marine ice sheet instability and how it's linked to this bedrock. Um, here's a ship, here's some icebergs. So here's, you've got the ocean. The idea is that you have this ring of warm water, the circumpolar deep water, around the continental shelf, around Antarctica. But in some places, and particularly in the Amundsen Sea area, it comes onto the continental shelf and hits the ice. And it's much warmer than the other water, so it starts melting it away. And the idea of the marine ice sheet instability is that if you do get some initial melting underneath here, in this, so this is the floating ice shelf and then the glacier going onto the rest of the ice sheet, if you get an initial bit of melting and that makes that edge of the ice sheet retreat, which is called the grounding line, then the thickness of the ice at the grounding line has increased if that bedrock is sloping downwards. So just geometrically, if the bedrock is going down, the edge of the ice retreats, then that sort of gate, if you like, of ice flux uh, increases uh, in thickness. And there's basically glaciological theory that says the flow of the ice is very strongly dependent on that thickness. So the flow increases, and that makes that grounding line retreat more. So that's a positive feedback. You know, your initial retreat leads to more ice flow into the ocean, leads to more grounding line retreat, leads to more ice flow, and faster ice flow. And so there are two ways that you could trigger this. One is this melting from underneath, and the other is um, actually if you lose this ice shelf, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second, then that ice shelf, actually it has this, what, you know, what we call a buttressing effect. It sort of helps to stem the flow of the glacier. And if you take that away, then that ice can flow more quickly. And that effectively can kick off that same process of instability. So this is the idea from 50 years ago. Um, I think, did I lose a slice? Yeah, so I just want to show this is a nice picture um, from the, I think it's from the iStar project of Pine Island Glacier. This is them taking um, uh, measurements of the bedrock with ground penetrating radar. And this is a... Um, uh, effectively a sunbow, so it's like a halo based on the ice crystals in the air. I forgot what is it, ice bow, is that what it's called? Someone who's, anyone, Tina, anyone? Um, but yeah, it's just beautiful. So that was the, the past and the imagination, then a little intersection into Antarctica and, and why we're particularly worried about this idea of instability, which of course can lead, instability implies potentially rapid and you know, um, sustained ice losses. So the physics, 
new stories of Antarctica from observations and from physical modeling. Well, I've already sort of given away this part a little. Uh, I can't remember if this video is going to work. Um, I had a little video of flow, but I may have forgotten to re-embed it. Yeah, it was basically showing a video of the ice flow. Um, in 2014, this is a little paragraph I, I wrote um, about what I thought was the most important science moment in 2014 because there were these three papers, one on satellite observations and two on glacier modeling of Pine Island and Thwaites that said, actually, we think this is happening now. Now, not necessarily because of humans, we don't know if we've affected that circulation of circumpolar deep water. Um, it's not that we didn't know already that the area was losing ice, but it's this idea that the satellite data showed really a, a widespread retreat of the grounding line across that whole region of the Amundsen Sea. So that would be consistent with this idea of a, of a forced retreat. And that the glaciers modeling studies basically looked at that area and said, well, if we look at how the behave, you know, the, the observations and the, um, you know, the predictions of that glacier sort of fit together, we think it looks like an unstable retreat. It looks like this, this hypothesis. So we, so, so now, so this moving from these observations, we now enter a new era of the modeling. Because to some extent, the ice sheet models were improving, have been improved. You know, lots of people are adding more and more processes and increasing the resolution of the models. So the models are getting better, but also, and I think from my point of view, my research um, interest, even more importantly, is people started to think about the uncertainty in the models and how you can get around, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this is, you know, what I name my um, blog after because it's so important because the whole point is models are always inadequate in some way and they're always, they always have limitations. But with ensemble modeling where you run lots of different versions of the model and try to sample the uncertainties, then you really start to understand the ways in which your limit, the limitations of your model can be effectively bypassed by covering a lot of different possibilities for the future and increasing your uncertainty about the future. But then conversely, using observations like this to try and test which of those different ensemble members is most realistic. So you're able to get a handle on the extent of the limitations of your model in a quantitative way. And that's my area of interest particularly. So we had this paper in 2015 uh, led by Catherine Ritz which was taking an Antarctic ice sheet model and running it 3,000 times to see what would happen with lots of different input settings, parameter settings, and so forth. And then um, we did a Bayesian calibration where we basically weighted each ensemble member's prediction for the future according to how well it reproduced the satellite trend of mass loss, um, actually just in the Amundsen Sea embayment. And what that allowed us to do is instead of coming up with point estimates, one number for the future, we came up with probability distributions and, and also probability maps. So this is a probability map of the grounding line retreating by the year 2200. So these purple is very likely, Pine, Pine Island and Thwaites, uh, and then we have this low probability regions, sort of like the Cypal Coast and up here as well. The blue areas are where the bedrock's below sea level. And so you can get these probabilities of retreat and probability of sea level contribution, um, for example, here is 30 centimetres by 2100. So a 5% chance would be more than that. Um, conveniently, that's quite close to the several uh, uh, centimetre, you know, tens of centimetres from AR5. Um, so this, this is now the, the new kind of, hopefully the new normal in Antarctic and actually in Greenland ice sheet modelling, although Greenland were doing it for earlier, they had been doing it for longer. But then another wild card got thrown into the mix. So now we're going back to the beginning of the story, this ice apocalypse story from 2016. Catching up to the present day. So this is now marine ice cliff instability. So just out of interest, hands up if you think you've roughly heard of this idea or this paper from 2016. Yeah, so it was quite, it was quite widely known, but not, not by everyone. Um, so the idea of this is it's another way of imagining how Antarctica can lose ice very quickly. And instead of thinking about the glacier flow and how fast that's going, it's much more about um, very quickly carving off, sort of chopping off ice at the coast. See, the idea is that if you, if you do lose an ice shelf at the edge of Antarctica, which could also trigger the marine ice sheet instability, 
But if that left behind a flat, tall cliff of ice at the coast, that that can be inherently and structurally unstable. If you think about it, every material has its own kind of inherent you know, strength. You couldn't have an infinitely tall cliff of ice. Um, and so there, so there was this, uh, this theoretical limit of about 100 meters above the waterline that was proposed so that if your ice cliff collapsed here and left behind this coastal cliff, that that would be unstable and crumble into the ocean. But of course, the bit behind it would still be tall. So then the next bit would crumble into the ocean and then the next bit would crumble into the ocean. And so it would be unmitigated ice loss and, mu and crucially much more rapid than you could do even with the marine ice sheet instability. And the motivation for this was partly, as I say, the theory of the ice mechanical sort of, you know, um, structure, but also the idea that at least some ice sheet models were struggling to lose enough ice to reproduce past sea level rise. So this is a, a model simulation of the ice sheet in the mid Pliocene about three million years ago. Uh, so going back much further than I've talked about so far, where it's about an 11 meter contribution to sea level. So Antarctica alone, the total sea level would have been higher. Showing this West Antarctic loss in the warmer climate. Um, this is the kind of 400 ppm world that people quite often talk about. And so the idea is that some ice sheet models were struggling to lose enough ice that you know, we thought would contribute to those high sea levels of the past, you know, 20 meters or more um, in that period. And this parameterization that they did of this, um, so let me, hang on, let me think about the thing of this. So this is a, a, a diagram of this 2016 paper, but the process itself, this, um, this hypothesis had been proposed in 20, uh, the year before, uh, in a paper led by Dave Pollard. And interestingly, the way that they'd represented it in their model was described as somewhat speculative. Not the idea, the whole idea, but the way that it was represented in the model was a little bit, you know, back of the envelope, should we say. So this is just a picture to show that this ice shelf collapse does happen. You know, I'm sure you know this already, but this is Larson B from 2002, disintegrating, you know, and we've seen other partial losses of ice shelves as well. You know, this is over the period of, I think it was two or three weeks. Um, and then this is a very recent picture, actually. I don't know if you've heard, there's a boat that's been going out to Thwaites Glacier recently. And this is um, the edge of Thwaites, a new picture um, from February, I think, showing effectively these, these tall cliffs. Um, so this 2016 paper, they, they ran an ensemble. So they ran 64 different versions of the model, changing different input parameters. And then they rejected any that didn't reproduce the reconstructed Antarctic contribution to sea level in two different periods. The last interglacial period that I've mentioned, so they had a range of three and a half to seven and a half meters, or this mid Pliocene warm period of about three million years ago. And because that was uncertain, they said, well, we either think it's going to be between five and 15 meters contribution or 10 and 20 meters contribution. So they ran the model for the Pliocene and the last interglacial and the future. And they had 64 versions of that. So then they rejected anything that failed the Pliocene test and anything that failed the last interglacial test and kept the rest for the future, kept the last ones from that 64 for the future. And that was their model calibration. And what they came up with, they had a few different, you know, um, variants in the, in the paper, but this, this is showing up to one and a half meters this century of sea level contribution, now just from Antarctica alone, remember, not, not total, where this mean here is one meter, over one meter. Now all the previous, so that's one meter from Antarctica, whereas AR5 was saying up to one meter from all contributions. And AR5 had said Antarctica was sort of, t you know, 10 centimeters or so this century, unless there was this collapse that would give you a few more tenths of a cent uh, tenths of a, meter, several tenths of a yeah, meter. So this is now basically 10 times bigger under RCP 8.5, the high emissions scenario, 10 times bigger than AR5 estimate for Antarctica and double the total sea level, total sea level rise predictions. So it's no wonder that it called, got called this ice apocalypse. And in terms of the language, um, 
this, this sort of somewhat speculative got translated into previously underappreciated. So again, it's this idea of like steering the narrative of, you know, this, this is something that really needs to be taken um, seriously and into account. And moving from that um, scientific rest reticence, I guess, of a very new parameterization and a very new process, a very new hypothesis into, well, this is previously underappreciated. And, and they're talking about different things, right? I mean, this underappreciated is really talking about the cliff failure. And I think the physical theory of cliff failure is one thing that is probably quite well established and, 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 and agreed upon. And then the somewhat speculative is really about how it was put into their model. But we have to unpack this. We have to understand what's being referred to. And so if you plotted, um, so that nice, um, this was a, a mean plus or minus one um, standard deviation projection. But if you take a slice at that 2100, how am I doing for time? Um, I'm going to just whiz through this last um, bit. Um, you can see this is the, the line that I just showed you. This is the sea level equivalent at 2100, sort of focused on about a meter. But this is now probability of frequency distribution of the, the ensemble runs. The whole of the 64 are in gray, where, and then the ones that were selected with one of these calibrations what is the is the red dark red and so what it's just showing is that you know it's quite a small sample size it's not symmetric it's skewed um, you know it's not really clear what's happening in terms of probabilities you know an ensemble can't always give you um, give you that um, I'm going to skip that so the idea that we actually know I can show it. Um, and the idea of this um, Pliocene data range being uncertain. If you, if you plotted the data and instead of just using a 5 meter minimum or a 10 meter, you actually did a continuous, you know, you did a sensitivity analysis of what happened if you calibrated with this minimum or this minimum or this minimum or this minimum, you found that actually it was quite sensitive. And that very high 1 meter, this is the mean result as a function of the lower bound of the Pliocene data range and the, the, and the uncertainty intervals narrowing as you increase that. And so these very high one meter predictions came about when you were up at this end with a, with a high Pliocene contribution. So there's quite a strong sensitivity there and that's partly because of the small ensemble size. So what we did in the paper that came out um, in February this year, sorry, was to try and get around the small sample size thing with this emulation, which is statistical modeling of the ice sheet model, to try and reproduce what it would have said for any possible parameter value. And that meant, this is basically um, what you want is a one-to-one -one line where your statistical model is predicting your ice sheet model um, correctly, uh, and it is mostly doing um, a pretty good job. Um, and so basically, you know, you, you, you take that 64 member ensemble and you, you fill in the gaps. It's effectively interpolation. And that means you can cover that whole parameter space and all the different possibilities and come up with 10,000 versions or a million, if you like, of, this, of the ice sheet model. Now, there are some limitations, and I can talk about it after if you're interested, but broadly speaking, what we did is here is the future prediction of the sea level at the end of the century. Uh, against, for example, the last interglacial. And so the big blobs are their model runs, and then the little grey ones are the emulator filling in the gaps. And so you reject everything outside the data range on the x-axis to try and narrow the range for the future. So what we also did was we revisited the choices they made in the calibration. So we, d we thought because of the, re the sensitivity to the Pliocene range and because we know the Pliocene contribution to sea level is very uncertain, we basically used a wide range for that. We basically used a combined range. We also calibrated with satellite data. So this is against the Pliocene and this is against the satellite data. I can show in more detail if you're interested. Basically saying, let's test the model with the Pliocene and the last interglacial and the last 25 years of data. And we came up with these probability distributions. So instead of a mean plus or minus one standard deviation, we could come up with a full distribution because we had 10,000 runs, effectively, simulations, statistical you know, representations. And so if you can see in pale pink, that original lumpy, bumpy histogram 
that I showed before. Actually, that's a, a slightly different histogram, but it's the same sort of idea. Where you've got a smallish sample size, you've got a mode down here, it's a bit skewed, turns into this red solid line where we filled in the gaps and the emulator has been able to provide us with a probability distribution to try and understand the shape and the, and the, the relative probability of different numbers. And because of those different things that we did, we found that the mode, the, the peak, was down at about 45 centimetres. So kind of roughly half those high numbers, um, still with a decent chunk of probability of being above one metre, but skewed. The last thing I just want to show that was just really cool that you can do with the emulator is that you could switch off this marine ice cliff instability. And that was just conveniently because of the way they set up the model. You could, set, you, could, you could turn it off and still do the same calibration, make sure that the model passed the tests, you know, the three different tests. Turn off the instability and you get these much, much, as you'd expect, much, much lower sea level predictions down at a sort of 30 to 50 centimetres maximum, which is in line with not only our paper, the Ritz et al. paper that I mentioned, but actually a few others that have come out in between AR5 um, and now as well, where the, the upper limits are sort of 30, 40 centimetres, um, 45, very much like that AR5 several tenths of a metre, in fact, now that we're including the uncertainty quantification and the idea of instability in our models. So that's really all I wanted to show, apart from just to say, you know, watch this space. Um, this is some of the language, we, you know, I want to make sure that I own up to our language. You know, we put that the marine ice cliff instability was a hypothesis and, you know, it's controversial and previous interpretations of these projections were overestimates. So, you know, we, we're as, as guilty, if you like, of anyone as, 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 of steering the language on this. But also they have new, De Conto and Pollard, Rob De Conto is the lead of that other paper, they have new results coming out that look a little less high, even with their ice sheet model, um, than our paper. So this is not published yet. This is reported from AGU um, in, uh, online in 2019. Um, so, so that's something that uh, you should look out for. But this is clearly an ongoing story that will continue. And the final kind of point really is just that what we, what we need, you know, so the sort of summary if we're constructing knowledge about sea level rise, you know, we have the problem of no perfect analogues. Experts disagree, understandably. Uh, we have sparse and uncertain data, you know, a, a short satellite record. Um, paleo data is always difficult, always difficult to quantify uncertainties for. And we know that physical models are limited. And that creates this space, as I said, for this narrative around sea level rise and Antarctica particularly. So what we need is, you know, we only have one model that does this marine ice cliff instability published at the moment. So we really need the community to look into this and use these ensembles to explore the uncertainties. The data, of course, the observations and the paleo data, particularly quantifying uncertainties that will really help us pin down the model. And then statistics, you know, this is my area, is the emulation and the uncertainty quantification you know, it's your friend because it, uh, it's not hard statistics. If you're interested in emulation, come and talk to me afterwards. Um, it's, it's really curve fitting. It's really interpolation. Um, but it helps you to learn more about your model and have more confidence in what it's doing because you've, you've really dug around um, in, the, in the parameter space and all the different possibilities. Um, so I'm on Twitter and I also wrote at, at my blog um, an article about the, the Nature Paper as well if you want to go back and look at... Uh, look at that any more detail. All right, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks a lot, Samson. Um, we have time for some questions, although it's almost fine, so if you do have to rush off, then feel free. But we've got time for some questions, and we've got some refreshments coming in as well. Um, well if you ask a question, could you please, I'll pass the mic on if you speak into it, because it's being picked up for the recording. So do you have any questions for Samson? Uh, thank you. Uh, is this on? Um, yeah, when, when the okay, yeah. Um, Simon Burkett, um, uh, I was on the um, high level group for the Global Environment Outlook, which was published in March. The, what, sorry, the, the Global Environment Outlook, the UN Environment's Global Environment Outlook. Um, what, what would help, I guess, for those of us who are campaigning or communicating in this space? 
uh, is to um, understand in the way with IPBES, um, uh, the GEO report, IPCC, different things, is some big messages that you agree on as well as areas that you disagree on. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think that would help the general public um, mm -hmm. understand um, whether ice, is, uh, ice or sea level rise is not really an issue and the main issue is probably about changes in weather or drought yeah. or migration in terms of climate That's impacts. That's a great question and, and for this audience I didn't emphasise enough what we know. Um, sea level is going to go up no matter what we do, right? Under the most stringent mitigation scenarios we can think of, it's going to go up. The bottom of that blue and red graph is uh, about 30 centimetres. 30 centimetres is still a lot in terms of increasing the probability of flooding. It's still something we have to adapt to. Um, now, when I said there was a model consensus uh, setting aside the marine ice cliff instability, there was a model consensus that Antarctic contribution could be up to 30 or 40 centimetres this century. That's still higher than that. AR5 report, there's a growing consensus of the literature since then, and that is also bad, because that's also worse than we thought in 2013. Um, and the other thing that is not really appreciated enough, I think, about Antarctica, most of the ice loss that we're seeing that's accelerating or has accelerated in the Amundsen Sea area is it's an adaptation issue because we have no idea how much influence we had on that because of it being this circulation pattern. You know, there's some, there's some ideas of how there may be, you know, teleconnections and warming and some direct ocean warming. And, you know, it may be that in um, 10 years, we can say that 10% or 80% of it is, is human influence. But for me, that's almost more worrying because it's a facet of the natural world that we don't understand very well is causing uh, sea level rise that we need to adapt to and we don't think we can do anything about it. So in terms of adaptation and figuring out how to live on the coasts effectively uh, and economically and, and, so, and fairly, um, it's almost more worrying because there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah. Hi, Tina van der Vliet from Imperial College here. Um, I really enjoyed how you look at it um, in terms of a narrative. And I'm just wondering, um, taking the aspect that you are a lead author on the upcoming IPCC report as well, the narrative very strongly focuses on the sea level by the year 2100. And um, listening to the news presentation um, you know, from, from the other groups, um, it, it seems like you're all converging there on numbers now which is wonderful, um, and as you said, it, it's still a lot and it's still to worry about, but if I think about adaptation and long-term future, shouldn't we shift some of the narrative as well to making sure that there is an equilibrium response of ice sheets which works slower than the next 100 years and that there's a lot more to come and that we need to make the public more aware of that as well? I completely agree that there's not enough focus on the longer term. Um, so there's a limit to how much I'm supposed to talk about the internal workings, I think, but you know, marine ice cliff instability in Antarctica dominates the conversations in our chapter. You know, we're always kind of talking about the Antarctic contribution and particularly the ice cliff instability and how credible that is and what evidence there is. We're also talking about how 2100 is not enough and we do need to be thinking about 2120 and 2150 at least. You know, it's no longer 100 years away, right? We always think of it as 100 years away, and it's really not 100 years away anymore. So we're definitely thinking, how can we at least extend that a little bit, even if there aren't many extra studies that we might perhaps be able to extrapolate a little bit so that we can get a few decades more with some you know, in inflated uncertainties. But what's really noticeable when you review the literature is how little there is on the long term. It's a handful of papers on multi-millennial commitment. Um, and of course, if these instabilities are, are right, there's quite a possibility that even if you take away the original trigger, as you know, um, it keeps on collapsing. That's the point. Um, so the idea of commitment and um, stability temperature threshold, which is obviously one of the main parts of the one and a half degree report is, is that a threshold for West Antarctic ice sheet collapse? Have we already exceeded it? Uh, could it exacerbate it? But when you look at the literature, 
not only is, the hand, is there a handful of papers, but about two thirds of them use the same ice sheet model. And not only that, but there's hardly any ensemble stuff because of the length, you know, doing hundreds and thousands of years limits your capacity to do ensemble uncertainty quantification. So I think it's a massive uh, gap in our knowledge. And I think the, from what I understand is that there's a pretty wide range, isn't there, of what could happen in terms of commitment over thousands of years. Uh, how you express that in terms of emission scenarios and temperature thresholds and cumulative carbon budgets and stuff is another question again, so that you can compare apples with apples. But yeah, it's, um, I, say, I think we know nothing beyond 2150, effectively. I mean, apart from it will be higher. <laughs> you know, we know the sign of the change. Uh, we know the ballpark. But we don't know. I think it's really hard to put quantitative numbers beyond that at the moment. Yeah. So for me, the, um, the problem in, term, in terms of our narratives is how we have, I mean, how I think based on this, we should reconfigure our purpose um, towards scientific-based uh, metrics and how this could become those. Because um, I come from the, the climate change masters in the business school, and all we do there is this, like, green bullshit of, like, ESG and like now like incorporating like a few things here and there to these like ESG metrics and whatever green finance. Can you explain ESG metrics quickly? It's basically environmental social governance. Yeah. So when you invest, you have to invest in a in a way that is green or whatever, you know. So now we it's like it's the perfect like com consumerism story, you know. I can like do the same thing but also feel good about it, you know. And and it's just like this with everything, you know. And seeing what goes on in there and how like people are trying to be green billionaires and how that is like the purpose. I mean, I quite like to be a green billionaire. <laughs> no, like, sure, I, I just think it's like completely, if we're looking for sustainability, that is the problem, you know, that, that we can't have this, you know? So how do we get this? Because it's not only about communicating to the public, but it's also about like reconfiguring the purpose of what we do and how, how to use these metrics to create scientific targets that we no. pursue rather than risk and returns based on whatever we do, so well, I think that the role should be to how can you influence politics so that the purpose is not this like GDP, like yeah. consumption thing and, and, and we go towards, a, you know, like a, a, a way of measuring progress that is based on, 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 on science and not on, on, on this like fiction, you know? Yeah, I mean, climate change is obviously a vast, vast endeavor, you know, and I'm up at the physical climate science end. And I'm not down at the economic solutions end. Um, you know, any, any expertise I have in communication is just from practicing it, not from researching it, for example, and what works or what, you know, what different messages mean to different people. Um, there are plenty of brilliant experts out there that I'm finding more and more of who do speak to those issues more. Certainly, in terms of the current climate, as it were, I am finding it very weird as a climate scientist to finally find climate change being an acceptable and mainstream topic of conversation in the last month or so particularly. So um, it's great, you know. So in terms of people, sort of ordinary people if you like, as opposed to businesses and things, caring about it, wanting to make a difference, happy to talk about it, asking what to, can be done. There were always those people, but it's now broadened out to a much broad, you know, wider sector of the population, I think, there's a much greater acknowledgement that not only does something have to be done, but everything has to be done. There's a lot less, um, should we do this or that, because the IPCC 1.5 degree report showed we need to do everything if we want to meet the Paris targets. So, you know, I mean, I'm an optimist in general. But I agree that um, you know, there are complex conversations to be had, and I think there are probably people attached to the Grantham Institute who would, who would um, speak to that better than I could. Uh, we're going to take one more question, if that's all right. Did, do you have Hi, um, I've got a slightly more pedantic science question, which is so... Great. Um, going back to your, your emulation study, you, you said you concluded that uh, previous estimates of marine ice cliff instability may have been overestimated. Um, but looking at your, your PDF, it looked to me more like that was not so much because your results were different to the De Conto and Pollard ones, but more was due to the choice of the mode as your metric of choice rather than the mean of the distribution. And is that fair? And if so, is that justified? I, I carefully chose previous interpretations. 
So the reason for that, and I didn't have time to go into it, it's a really good point. The, the, the PDF is not that different from the underlying histogram. Um, there's two things. One is that we rejected this high Pliocene contribution. And so what I show here is the, compared to the, the, the results with the low Pliocene contribution. So if I was to show the full or the high Pliocene calibration, then that would be up here and it would look lower. So it's partly that. The other is that word interpretation. Because when people, this is really, really important, and this was something I was a little cross about with the paper. Oh, gone too far. Um, what do you think of when you see a mean plus or minus one standard deviation? What distribution do people think of? What do people think is the neutral choice of a probability distribution? It's the normal distribution. And so people were taking this to mean a Gaussian distribution. In other words, a symmetric about the mean distribution. So it was actually the interpretations of the result or how they were used and assumed to be that as a neutral choice or as a, cho as a choice, as the first choice, that was part of what I was we were talking about. So it was the, it was the rejecting the high Pliocene and it was exactly, it was, it was highlighting and, and estimating the shape of that distribution with, with a larger sample size than you could have done here. But they didn't plot this. This is from my paper, our paper. And so that's, what, that's why I got a bit cross. I thought it was a bit naughty that they didn't show that this is, um, and this is the more generous plot. This is 29 ensembles of the 64. Actually, the high player scene only kept 15. So that is based on the mean and plus or minus one standard deviation of 15 numbers. And so you can't assume it's Gaussian, and it's, you especially can't if you can see that the mode is low like this. In fact, one of, some of the distributions are bimodal. So yeah, so it's not that the estimate is different, it's more like the interpretation and the assumptions. So yeah, it's a good point. Okay, we're going to end it there, that's all right. So let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> um, but we are going to have some refreshments, and I think Tamsin's sticking around for a yeah, while, so if yeah, you have yeah, some more questions, come, come along. Uh, thanks for coming. And just to say our last uh, seminar for this academic year will be on the 5th of June where we have uh, Leo Hickman, the editor-in-chief of uh, Carbon Brief, coming to talk. So I hope to see... Uh